Okay, thank you so much, Lorena. That was a very kind uh, introduction. So I'm going to talk to you today about PERC, uh, which is Python for Reactor Kinetics. And I'm a nuclear engineer. So when I talk about reactors, I mean nuclear reactors. Um, so PERC is one of my many projects. Uh, as Lorena mentioned, I have a whole bunch of them in the world of scientific computing education. Um, I also have a couple in nuclear engineering that I contribute to, including the Cyclist Code and the Pine Python for Nuclear Engineering uh, library. But today I'm going to talk to you about PERC. And this is its little logo, which I think is very clever. Um, <laughs> so um, PERC is Python for Reactor Kinetics. And since nuclear reactor kinetics is maybe not a fundamental domain, domain knowledge of most of you in here, we're going to go through a quick review of what nuclear reactor kinetics is. And then I will give you some very basic information about how the code is designed and quality controlled, what SciPy stuff I use in order to make that happen, and a very quick minimal example of a very simple reactor accident. Okay, so reactor kinetics. It all starts with fission. Nuclear reactors uh, are fissioning machines, and fission is when a neutron hits an atom, and that atom splits apart, spitting out some energy, that's that little burst there, and some other neutrons. Um, we model this with probabilities. So the likelihood that this thing is going to happen is we're going to call a cross-section. It's in units of area, but we won't go into it. It depends on a whole bunch of variables, and we call it sigma. OK. And that cross-section embeds a whole ton of physics. So um, you have elastic parts of that cross-section, inelastic parts of that cross-section. So those of you who are physicists are like, OK, so cross-sections are the probabilistic black box of nuclear particle interactions. Okay. And more than one fission will happen after those secondary neutrons are spit out. So once the fission occurs, you have the first neutrons that come off of the initial fission. Those neutrons themselves can generate more fissions. And that's how you get the nuclear chain reaction. So in a reactor, electricity is made when the heat from this nuclear chain reaction warms up some water somewhere in the system, spins a turbine, and puts it into the lights. So we call this nuclear chain reaction stability K. Okay, so this is the um, this is a variable that you're just going to have to keep track of a little bit. And when it's one, the reactor is critical. So at the end of this chain reaction, a whole bunch of isotopes are produced. So this graph is uh, on the bottom axis the um, isotopic number there, and on the y-axis you have the percent of the, of the isotopes that are produced. And it's an interesting shape. It's not, um, it's not consistent. The halves are often one-third and two-thirds sized. Um, anyway, um, all of the isotopes in the periodic table um, are made in a nuclear chain reaction. And we're going to call the isotopes I. Okay. So one other interesting fact is that once that isotope has been made out of the fission, so the, that piece of the isotope, that one of the, one of the two pieces that broke apart in the original fission. Um, once that's been made, sometimes uh, it's also unstable, and it kicks off what's called a delayed neutron. Okay. So there's the initial neutrons that come off of the fission, and sometimes the secondary isotopes that are made in that fission are unstable enough to kick off a, second, a third sort of a tertiary um, isotope called uh, <laughs> A tertiary neutron called a delayed neutron sometime later. And so this is an interesting kinetics problem, right? You might call this dynamics, but um, the time process of this is, uh, is quite interesting. Um, and we're going to call the probability that this neutron kicking up, kicks off an isotope beta i, all right? Um, you don't have to keep too much track of it, but ultimately, all of this stuff, uh, the likelihood that this um, reactor is going to increase or decrease in power. Um, all of that contributes to something called reactivity, which is a function of K, that criticalness of the reactor. All right, and we call K the neut neutron multiplication factor, and we call rho the reactivity. Okay, and now we get something complicated. So all of that combined plus some external reactivity um, can contribute to the total power in the reaction. Um, with there's the base reactivity in a critical reactor plus reactivity from feedback, and we're going to get into what that means, plus external reactivity, which might come from dropping a control rod or lifting one out. And that happens because different materials have different probabilities 
of fissions and the different like distributions of the isotopes that come out of them and everything. So um, keep in mind that the, these become the key equations uh, in, the, in the later solution. So anyway, it all depends on temperatures um, and it all feeds back. So reactivity over here feeds the neutron population, which is power, that K. Um, and each of the temperatures respond to that power because power is heat. And so the temperatures of the various components in your reactor, like fuel or coolant, respond to the power by like increasing, if the power is increasing. And so all those components, some of them have different reactivities, likelihoods of kicking off more neutrons or fissioning, and that feeds back into reactivity. Okay, so this loop, this reactivity feedback, is a very interesting dynamics problem, which is what PERC models. So I wrote a piece of Python code, of course, to model this matrix equation. We don't need to go into it right now. Um, just note that there's um, these descriptions that I've just given you about like how the reactor functions, these all contribute to that equation, and it's a big matrix like set of PDEs. There. So um, you can do a whole bunch of different things to solve this set of PDEs. Um, there's a lot of Monte Carlo that solves the um, static equation. You can even use Monte Carlo and loop it to solve a dynamic version of the equation, and the possibilities are infinite. What we're gonna use is um, a six precursor group. So the delayed neutrons come off of a certain set of isotopes, not all of them, just the ones that are unstable. And we're gonna lump those into six different groups, which is a standard way of doing it. Um, and so we're gonna model all the delayed neutrons as if they're coming from six groups of isotopes. And uh, 11 decay groups, so decay heat from fission, also comes from all the isotopes, but you can lump them by their decay properties into 11 distinct groups. And so we're gonna do that. And we're gonna model the thermal hydraulics of like how the temperatures respond to the power with a lumped parameter model, which is super simple, sort of 1D um, approximation similar to uh, a resistive circuit in, electro, in electrical engineering. And we're gonna put it all into Python and use Python's object-orientedness to make it easy to set up a simulation. So you can say, I want an object to represent the fuel and an object to represent the coolant. And those objects have attributes like their material isotopics and their cross sections and their response to reactivity, okay? And so all of that makes the whole thing a very geometry agnostic framework and a material agnostic framework because you can load a material class to describe those components um, that you invent and add to, uh, add to PERC. Uh, so to make PERC work, um, I tried to be as reproducible as possible, and I used a whole bunch of tools from the sci-fi stack, including one called Pint, which I discovered for this particular project and loved. So if you guys haven't tried it, it's called Pint, and it is a unit checking um, software. And um, of course, I version control it with Git and GitHub. I document it with Sphinx. I test it with Nodes. I have continuous integration in Travis, plot with Matplotlib, and I use sci-fi to do most of my ODE solves. So um, the next version will include some like Katie Huff specific ODE solves. Okay, so how does the unit checking work? This is really small, but what's really cool is that pint, you associate units with each value and they become quantities. And if you ever try to multiply two quantities to equal final quantity with incompatible units, pint will complain and you don't have to set up your own whole suite of unit checking in your code, which uh, as a physicist is incredibly valuable. Um, and in particular, as a physicist who's also an engineer, I encounter a lot of very complicated units um, that collide. Um, so engineers and physicists don't always agree on what units to use, and it's really nice to be able to speak in both languages. Um, so version control with Git, it's all on GitHub. It's automatically do documented, so we have a little website. Um, we have a test suite, so as I was saying, I use Nose, and so I try to get some good coverage on my test, but um, I'm the only developer right now, so I don't have as much uh, test coverage as I would like, so that's in my next version. We're currently in version 0 0.1, so uh, this is a super, super alpha version of this code, but, um, and all of that is continuously integrated um, on Travis. Oh, this is the wrong picture, but you guys know what Travis looks like. Travis is a continuous integration server. Um, 
Right. And so all of this, how does it work? So let's talk about the stuff you, you guys are interested in. So the way that this is designed, it just has a singleton simulation information object that collects the input from a single input file where the engineer can set up their simulation, name those objects, create a fuel object, give it attributes like its cross-section behavior. Um, and that simulation object then creates a neutronic system and a thermal hydraulic system and runs the communication between those things in order to do the ODE solve of that big matrix, which is a combination of neutronics and thermal hydraulics. Um, the neutronic system mostly calculates the change in temperature, the change in decay heat, and the change in reactivities um, based on the uh, temperature and that any external reactivity insertion that the simulator likes to, like wants to model. Um, and by the simulator, I mean the user. Uh, the TH system um, manages various thermal hydraulic components, so those things that respond with a temperature, and then feed back to the reactivity. And the components themselves are the objects that the simulation runner, the user, has, uh, has defined. Each of those TH components, like I said, has a material, and that's a very important part of this. Um, um, these classes right now include various materials that I'm interested in, including FLIB, which is a type of salt, and graphite, which is graphite, uh, and stainless steel 316, which is a really common nuclear grade steel, um, and a lot of others. But just keep in mind that you can add any material class that you want, because uh, it's open source and it's a really simple API for the material class. Okay, neutronics itself, the simulations right now um, in version 0 0.1 can only be driven by reactivity insertions. So there are a lot of types of accidents and transients that can happen in a nuclear reactor. These include startup and shutdown, where the reactivity changes from zero to critical or critical to zero. And they also include accidents where the coolant stops moving or um, you drop a control rod. And right now, PERT can only model the dropping a control rod type where you insert some external reactivity. But in the future, it will include more. The lump parameter heat transfer model, I'm not going to go into the math, but it's like a resistive circuit um, and it assumes that all the components are lumps. It has a constraint. You only want to use it for certain sizes of lump. It has a BO number constraint, but you can split any lumped object into many small lumps and it'll become valid again. So you want to use it in a valid way or else you'll get the wrong answer. Okay, now that I have only a couple of minutes, I will give you just the minimal example of what PERC actually does. So given all that background, and given the fact that it can now run a transient, and it can do these reactivity insertion accidents, um, one of the kinds of things that, uh, in fact, the kind of thing that you want to do as a nuclear, re and nuclear reactor engineer, in, in particular a designer of nuclear reactors, is um, prototype various reactor designs and see how they respond to accident transients. And so let's take a typical advanced reactor design that's supposed to re respond beautifully to an accident. So a sodium-cooled fast reactor is a super cool type of reactor that because of its in inherent physics, in an extreme reaction situation where like you introduce a whole bunch of extra reactivity, it shuts itself back down to a normal power, which is actually really wonderful and beautiful. Um, and that's entirely based on the physics. So the pieces of this is I've got a sodium coolant, a metal fuel, and I hold the inlet temperature um, steady. And this is just a really toy example. And then I drop, I pull out a control rod, so I increase the reactivity, and then I drop it back in a second later. And that dropping looks like this. So here's the docs for the reactivity insertion. I use this information. I put a little function, excuse me, <laughs> into the, um, I put a little function into the input file to represent that. And then I get out as the um, response in this simulation, a reactivity insertion. And it looks just like uh, I was expecting. And the response from the power incorporates the temperature response that we were expecting and some of the reactivity response. Anyway, and then drop back in the control rod and you can see the transient ends. I add the components in this way. This is what the input file looks like when I add a fuel and a coolant and an inlet. I won't go into it, but that's all the stuff that an actual person needs to add in order to make this happen. And then they connect to the components with some heat transfer. And that's all the com commands that uh, someone needs to put in the input file. And what they get back out is they put in a reactivity insertion and they get temperatures for each component that come up like um, with some delay and then come back down um, in order to model that transient. So that's all I had to show you. Uh, it's really short. And now you've learned a lot about nuclear reactors. And um, I have graduate students, Sin Huang,
um, who is Per Peterson's graduate student, who I also work for, and uh, Professors Ehud Griezmann and Max Fratoni, who uh, have helped me with this. And I'm funded by many people. <laughs>